welcome to On Call After Hours, where we answer the questions we weren't able to get to during the broadcast portion of our show. All of your questions are important to us. We want to answer as many as we can for you. So let's go right at it, boys. Caller had atrial flutter that was converted five years ago. What caused it? How is this different from atrial fib? So atrial fib flutter, what is it? And um, Atrial uh, flutter is uh, where the upper chambers of the heart, the atrium, are beating very fast, usually around 350 beats a minute, and give a fairly regular signal to the lower chambers of the heart whereas atrial fibrillation, the upper chambers are beating over a thousand beats a minute, very fast, erratic signal to the lower part of the heart. Causes of atrial flutter and fibrillation are often quite the same, and there's, a, there's the a, a long, longer list of those, but yeah. 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 All right, caller's been told she can't eat green vegetables while on warfarin. Why? And could aspirin replace the warfarin? Steve. Well, the green vegetables carry vitamin K, and that's uh, how Coumadin works, by uh, inhibiting vitamin K. So if you're uh, on warfarin, and particularly broccoli is one of the worst, and you're consuming quite a bit of that, you will not get the effect that you need from your uh, warfarin or Coumadin. I, I always like to tell them, eat your vegetables, but eat them every day the same, that's so that right. you know, it can be consistent. Yep. Consistency. Right. Yeah, 52-year-old son has idiopathic cardiomyopathy for 15 years, idiopathic cardiomyopathy, has a pacemaker and a defibrillator, also has a muscle, muscular dystrophy. Is there a connection between the heart problem and the muscular dystrophy? Bruce? Yes, uh, very, very many patients with particular types and forms of muscular dystrophy can have cardiomyopathy and it's a part of the muscular dystrophy. It's very important though to be sure they're not other family members that have had sudden death episodes or episodes of unexplained syncope that have the other forms of uh, inherited cardiomyopathies, which can be fatal. Right. Well, this person has a defibrillator, and, and so I think safer. He's very safe. Yep. yep. Very good. And, and then the assumption is that it's related to the muscular yep. dystrophy. And that's that heart idiopathic, meaning we don't know why it you is, why. but it's weak. And actually, it's probably muscular dystrophy. It's probably muscular dystrophy in that particular situation. There's a new drug from uh, Norv Nor Novartis. He said it was a breakthrough for heart failure. Is it available in Sioux Falls? Either one of you know a new heart failure drug? No, I, I do not know. From Novartis. From Novartis. Um, I'm thinking it could be the uh, spiral. I mean, the major drugs are spironolactone, right, right, uh, right. a beta blocker like uh, carvedilol or uh, uh, and or yeah. and toprol. Right. It may be a and uh, diuretics. It would probably fall within the pre-existing classification in some form. Maybe the new spironolactone. That's the other one, spironolactone. There's a new there's, spironolactone. There's epilarinone. That's Inspira, though. Um, so it, it may be a new ACE inhibitor or some right. something in that. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so an ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, diuretics, spironolactone. Mainstays of Mainstays of heart failure. Right. Discuss the heart disease risk for a diabetic. Steve. Uh, typically what they get, they get small vessel disease. Their coronary arteries get diffusely diseased and uh, we'll see that quite often. And uh, those are actually some of the patients that we do bypass for and have better results. Uh, uh, Multi-vessel disease in a diabetic uh, have fairly good indications right. for surgery. I went to an international internal medicine conference. They said diabetics need to go probably to surgery more than, than, than right. uh, and, and to address what is the heart risk of a diabetic, yeah. it's a coronary artery disease equivalent. You have atherosclerosis if you have diabetes yeah. and, and need to address it as right. well. Here's Rapid City. Man in his 60s has gained 70 pounds in the past 10 years after a very active lifestyle running 35 marathons, doing Ironman even. How can he get back into exercise and save his heart? You recommend a treadmill stress test before he gets back into it? Yeah, I, I first look into the causes and make sure that it certainly is just a lifestyle issue. Oftentimes middle-aged men will develop sleep apnea, have increasing fatigue. Uh, we didn't get to talk a lot about sleep apnea, but that's one of the causes Good of one. increased fatigue. Um, uh, testosterone levels uh, can drop at that stage, increased body weight. Um, so you want to make sure there's not some other cause such as hypothyroidism, but once those things have been looked at by their primary care physician, a routine stress test, you don't need expensive imaging just to make sure it's safe to get your heart rate up and start exercising. And get going, do it slowly, don't right. hurt right. anything on the way, start with good brisk walking, right. that's all. 
Brandon, uh, is there a risk of taking too much fish oil or for too long? You, any comment about fish oil, Steve? You a believer no, in fish oil? I, I am a believer in fish oil, but I don't know if there's any correlation if you take too much. Too much. You get a little diarrhea. You, yeah, you'll I get hear from your family members in the house. <laughs> <That's laughs> not too much risk of taking too much of that. No, no, it'll, it'll no. correct. But there is, a, there is a, right. there's something that goes with that. What causes an enlarged heart and what problems will it cause? An enlarged heart is heart failure. Um, and there's a lot of causes. A lot of causes. Yes. Yeah. Two, two biggest causes, uh, hypertension, making your heart very muscular and very big, or a dilated heart that's not pumping very well are the most common causes. Okay. Aberdeen, 85, your reactions, new Coumadin replacement drugs. Great question. Uh, I'm, I'm with you, Rick. I'm, I'm, a, with warfarin you. I'm a warfarin guy, so I don't mm -hmm. have much experience with the new ones, although I see the patients come to me uh, prescribe the new ones through cardiology or internal medicine. Four times more expensive. We're not sure about how safe they are. They're brand new drugs. But I see some people who can't take warfarin. It's a reasonable option. What's your take? I think it's a reasonable option if they're having a lot of difficulty uh, with fluctuating levels of their INR at age 85 with appropriate body weight, normal kidney function, a uh, lot of uh, good data showing some clinical superiority and certain individuals. Well, one thing I add, for, for the surgeon, uh, valve disease, uh, warfarin is the only thing the only that thing. you can use. So in my, my practice, that's what we use. If you have heart palpitations, at what point should you see your physician? Are some palpitations normal? The answer is yes. Everybody has palpitations. Right. I mean, they learned that doing Holter monitors on med students. Scared mm -hmm. them, oh my gosh, we really are in trouble with this sick patient, let's do a normal. Right. Oh, the normals are the same way. Right, right. Palpitations that make you short of breath, uh, come on suddenly without warning, like a light switch on and light switch off, uh, and make a, you feel lightheaded or associated with chest pain. That's another Need, story. Another story. What causes thick blood? What risks, if any, does this pose? Thick blood. Smoking. Polycythemia, low yeah. viscosity yeah. of the blood. Not, don't smoke. Don't smoke. smoke. But, uh, and there's some people who have hypercoagulable right. states they right. inherit or they they acquire. Right. And it's a, that's another. They usually show sometime with a DVT or a pulmonary embolus. Yeah. Or something. Clot in the leg. Blood, blood, blood clot the to their lungs. Right. Yeah. And, and it's usually not as you could look at it and say one's thick, one's thin. When we say thinness, we're talking about coagulation factors. What makes the heart clot? The right. the, the uh, blood clot. Uh, does tricuspid valve, discuss tricuspid valve problems. You ever do surgery on tricuspid? Yes, um, actually the trend now is with uh, patients with tricuspid insufficiency of uh, a degree greater than uh, mild, uh, we, we usually try to do something with, and repair is the primary uh, modality. Uh, a lot of times you can go in there and just cinch down the tricuspid valve and get a good re good result with that. But sometimes they say if you've got tricuspid regurgitation, it's just a, 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 an indicator of pulmonary hypertension. It can. A, a lot of patients with tricuspid regurgitation will have pulmonary hypertension. So you do have to be careful. If, you, if, if there's a if there's a component of right ventricular dysfunction, the right side of the heart isn't working very well. They've got pulmonary hypertension and a tricuspid valve that is uh, quite insufficient, then you gotta be real careful with those patients. Those, that's a tough story. Any that's, comment? That's a I'm tough hit. deal. Yeah, yes. wow. Yeah, I think the surgeon's just looking for things to do. No, oh. when, when, <laughs> when we were in medical school, they would always say, because everybody, everybody well, they would have right-sided endocarditis, and many times they would have to cut the tricuspid valve out, out. and you live without a tricuspid right. valve, but, but you want all four valves. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Uh, caller has fibrillation, exercises, feels okay. What does it mean for her future? I, I have people with atrial fib and they live normal, full lives. Right. And they, what do they lose? Five or ten percent of their, their squeeze, but mm -hmm. they can get used to it, adjust to right. it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, oftentimes, once they've adapted to it, their, their squeeze can stay the same. It's just they lose the forward output, but many people, if they have a good functioning ventricle, aren't reliant upon that squeeze. So. Yeah. Good prognosis as long as they are protecting against stroke. Right, and, and most even the people that you normalize back into a normal sinus rhythm, many times you still keep them anticoagulated, although not always. Quite a bit of the time you do. It's just, especially if they never knew when they went into it. If they have no way to know when they went into it, you only need to be it in for, for two days to form a clot, and then your risk is back to that 5% per year. Yeah. 
What causes a regular heartbeat? We've talked about that. 80-year-old woman has a hole in her heart. Should she be concerned? So this is atrial septal defect, probably. A ventricular hole between the ventricles needs always to be repaired, that, correct? Yeah, that's a different different animal. But an atrial mean. septal defect, what? Uh, in an 80-year-old? Uh, I'm not sure I'd do much about that yeah. unless there were and symptoms. It, and. Uh, and if you did autopsy on 100 patients, 20, 27 of them, you'd be able to stick a pin through the Pate it's paid for amenal valley. So it, without knowing more about the hole, it. So if I see an echocardiogram, I do an echocardiogram and I see flow going from the right side back to the left side, I'm worried about having lost our greatest body clot filter called the lung and that clots can flip in there and people can have strokes. So I worry about those. Do you repair those typically? Uh, now they usually just go in interventional. And, With that little uh, umbrella little thing. And plaques uh, uh, occluder and take care of it that way. And, and again, it takes the, you know, the right person doing that. You just don't do it on everyone. They're usually oftentimes in a trial. They need to actually be proven that they had an embolic event for no other reason that the, the size of the hole and the anatomy is appropriate for it, but it can be done all without having to have an open heart surgery. Right, the, the thing about it is that suddenly everybody was doing that. You know, everybody who had a septal defect, 27% of the population, uh, were getting those little devices yeah. at the tune right. of $20,000 or so. Right. Unfortunately, it hasn't panned out to, to be as preventative as we think, and there are still a number of patients having strokes even with those devices. Yeah, in. so something else was happening. Uh, this is, uh, we've answered atrial fib question again. What is uh, ejection fraction and what is normal? Ejection fraction is just the uh, uh, amount of blood from the main pumping chamber that gets pumped out in one cardiac cycle. And for a surgeon, you know, if I see someone 50 to 60 percent, I consider that normal. I don't know if I don't, I think cardiology and, and the good thing the to know is that if, if, if somebody tells you you have an ejection fraction of 50%, don't be depressed for a whole year and then ask, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> because I've had patients thinking 100% is normal. It's not. We don't pump out all the blood in our heart. It's between 50 to 65, yeah. 70%. Yeah. And uh, people can live very well, uh, but when you get less than 10%, you're pretty close to the end, aren't you? Now, they talk mm -hmm. about putting in... Uh, defibrillators at 30 percent or less because these people are at risk for sudden death. What do you think of that? Yes, uh, yeah, for for patients that have had a sequence of heart attacks that have left their heart with a, a pump function less than 35 percent or in a patient that has idiopathic or we don't know why a cardiomyopathy below 30 percent, they're at significant enough risk of sudden cardiac death that after treatment, trying to get them the best that they can, they haven't come above those numbers, it would be indicated to have a defibrillator. So 30% is the number you like, EF of 30% uh, in a reasonably young person? Uh, th yeah, 30% in, in uh, an idiopathic, but 35% in an ischemic cardiomyopathy. Oh, okay. they, they're, they're a little slightly higher oh. because of the scar formation. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Um, but that's an expensive deal. I mean, it isn't all Very comers. expensive deal, yeah. Uh, here's from Jefferson. Discuss ablation. What is it? How does it work? And how long does it last? Great question. We didn't <laughs> ablation. Good question. Uh, well, uh, uh, ablation is a technique uh, in, in particular mostly about atrial fibrillation ablations, but we've been doing ablations of uh, bypass tracts and pathways where you get an abnormal circuitry within the heart and uh, certain types are 100% treated and don't come back patients with a condition called Wolf Parkinson White where it's an accessory. We have excellent success with that. So and these people have these wildly fast heart rhythms fast because heart the electrical rhythms, system right. is bypassed. Can't be controlled with medicines and, and it's an alternative and it's actually indicated now for patients that have paroxysmal AFib where they feel horrible with it and it can be first line therapy. and. Uh, We've been doing a lot of atrial fib ablations. We're very fortunate. We just got a brand new South Dakota boy from Yankton, John Adams, who uh, I've had the privilege of mentoring through his medical school career, but he just came back from Stanford, did his EP fellowship, and has some new devices and new mapping techniques. Stanford in California. Yeah. And so he's got new techniques and he's... Well, new techniques, we have some new equipment that really cuts down on the mapping time. These procedures are very laborious yeah. and long, but boy, he can get in there and... 
you can you can identify it quite quick. So that's that has to do with abnormal heart rhythms, and it's a you just you go in there and you zap the the short, right? Cut out the short. Sixty-two year old mitral valve prolapse, no known problems. Taken a tenolol for thirty years. Well, I need this valve replaced, and what age should be the cutoff for replacement from Sioux City? Well, mitral valve prolapse. We a, talked about yeah, that. He's earlier. a typical patient that if uh, the dimensions of the ventricle are getting larger, he's getting into moderately severe to severe mitral regurgitation on echocardiogram. You, without symptoms, you can reasonably tell this patient if you think you can repair it that that's the treatment of choice. But we're not repairing all mitral valve prolapses, are we? Right. I mean, he's had it for 30 years. Yeah. He could have. He may not have any leakage at all. It's just prolapse, prolapse. and he can stay like that for yeah. the rest of his life. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much, both of you, thank again, you. for joining us thank and for, for staying us. afterwards yeah, for, for a, a ton of questions. And thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all of your questions and the opportunity to answer them. Be sure to join us next week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting at 7 o'clock Central Time. Call in your questions or email them. Watch uh, for our Prairie Doc Perspectives column in your local newspaper. Listen to our Prairie Doc Conversation radio show on a station near you. And follow us on Facebook, Pinterest, and Twitter. Next week we'll be talking about Ask Anything Internal Medicine and Neurology. So until next time, stay healthy out